This is actually, this is a fun story. So related to the knowable and the unknowable, and the known and the unknown within the knowable, our subjective relationship has to do with certainty and uncertainty. And think, think about it like this. In the, um, in the pre-modern world, in most of the kind of religious traditions, and maybe not some of the mystical interpretations of them, but at least in, in the uh, dominant expressions of the religious traditions, um, certainty had a pretty high value, right? I have certainty that I know who the right God is, and I didn't get the wrong God, and I'm dedicated to that one. I'm doing the right things, not the wrong things. And like, and if I get it wrong, like I go to, I could go to hell instead of going to heaven, or I could reincarnate badly instead of reincarnating well. And I'm certain enough that we can burn women as witches and do crusades and whatever we need to do because we have enough certainty about that rightness, right? Right. Now, science started to uh, emerge and have a lot more success in in really important things like aiming cannons um, and, you know, d practical physical things, which is actually a part of why it proliferated in one. Um, and it acknowledged certain kinds of uncertainties, but it also gave us the capacity for more certainty. Plenty of questions like do heavy things and light things or dense things and non-dense things fall at the same speed, we were able to start solving some of that stuff, right? And earth being round or flat or... We, and, um, and so even though within the philosophy of science, the purely uncertainty holding it is very deep, a lot of people carried the kind of emotional orientation towards certainty and to the way they did science and wanted to like be pretty sure that the world started with the universe started with the big bang and you know matter first and biology and consciousness emerged from neural networks and and this this isn't actually the philosophy of science it's actually an emotional structure of uh associating certainty with security and value and associating mm. uncertainty with insecurity, fear and lack of value, which create which is an emotional and existential bias leading to a cognitive bias. So then postmodernism saw these flaws and it said, shit, look at all the things that we fucked up in the name of over certainty. All the things we were certain about where we were wrong later. Even within the sciences when we were pretty certain we had it almost all figured out around the time of Maxwell's equations and modern physics fucked it all up. And that's just happened so many times we really shouldn't ever be certain about anything because historically we've been wrong about all of it. And whenever we were whenever we were over certain, we could do really terrible stuff. Mm. And so then postmodernism said we should actually embrace uncertainty about everything and kind of all certainty. And of course I'm radically simplifying all of pre-modernism and then modernity and then post-modernity. Um, but a move towards embrace uncertainty and any idea, any narrative is just one narrative and isn't f fundamentally true and we don't know. And so then it kind of pathologized certainty and made uncertainty laudable. And I think both of those are untenable. And, you know, we, we can actually see some major problems in the world from certain interpretations of postmodern that have led to the post-fact world that... Uh, have led to increased likelihood for strong man leaders to come in in a post-fact world. And, um, but I would say part of maturity is having a mature relationship with certainty and uncertainty inside of ourselves. And it's, it's what you could call it epistemic maturity, which is I have a reasonable confidence margin for certainty about these things based on the appropriate processes that I went through to come to it. And I have less confidence margin about these things, and I have no confidence margin about these things, but my security and universe and my self-worth aren't coupled to any of it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a, a big point that people become so emotionally wrapped up in it. And as, as you were talking about that the postmodernism there, I thought of someone who we featured on the site quite a bit, Jordan Peterson, who has a particular kind of gripe against who he calls postmodernists, and yet the people he's talking about seem to have gone kind of full circle where they've become very certain about their position, 
where things they're saying, well, there is no inherent truth in anything. And in particular, we'll talk about, say, cultural relativism or cultural yeah. appropriation. But they've suddenly become dogmatic about it, which seems to totally contradict the original point. If you read Foucault or Derrida or some of the good postmodern philosophers, there was like real insights there, right? There were, there were key important insights and they were not equally, like the critiques were not about all of the sciences equally. If you look at, say, the way we did social sciences and all of the bias that affects how we do social science, that is going to affect the way we do chemistry less, right? Not none, but less. Um, and so, you know, the, there are there are important insights there. But when you look at, so let you know, let's take a fun case. Let's take the conversation between Sam Harris and Dan Dennett about free will and consciousness. Mm -hmm. These guys are on the same team when it comes to you know atheism and the problems of superstitious ideas and. Uh, religious and metaphysical ideas. But then when it comes to foundational ontology itself, they actually disagreed on the deepest things one could disagree on, right? Sam says, consciousness is real, but there's no free will. And Dan said, no, there is free will, but consciousness is not real. Like the, Those are the deepest... And they, and they are both philosophers of science, and both have read the same books, and both understand critical thinking. It's like, well, how the fuck could they come to things that are that <laughs> different? And it, you know, and Sam actually said something really um, important in the end of that dialogue. If I don't know if you, if you've read it, but it's a, it was a fun one. He said, "It seems that we just have fundamentally different intuitions," and or something to that effect. And that that is actually like in AI. There's this thing called the symbol grounding problem. How do we get the symbols to ground into experience? Right when you when you when you think of an apple. You know things about the way an apple can be tart or sweet or mealy or its skin can kind of peel off or it can snap or like you have so many interdependent contextual things and you've taken it in through a tongue and a nose and your, your fingers and so many sensory organs plus the abstraction layers of it that the symbol has grounded, right? The symbol apple has grounded through all of those sensory channels. And so... If you haven't had some of the same sensory channels, you're not going to get the symbol grounding in the same way. So I'm, I'm studying the chemistry of an apple, but I haven't tasted it. No matter how much fucking chemistry about an apple I've got, and I know what the EEG patterns of people tasting it are, I still don't know what the fucking apple tastes like. Hmm. And so there is a place at which, as much as we're trying to be totally objective and logical... What, what, when we hear it, can land as true or not has to connect to some experience set that lands as true. Has to, it, it is not a purely, those axioms are reasonable and can be later reified by the process, and this, this was a good process for deriving other things from those axioms, so I accept it. The, one of the main sources of our cognitive bias isn't just the normal logical fallacies. Everybody, you know, those are easy to study. It's a bunch of emotional and existential level biases that affect the way we process. And that's where the really subtle work comes in. Hey, can you give a few examples? Yeah. Remember the first time that this hit me uh, so clearly, uh, a very long time ago, but I was... Um, I was young, I was talking to someone about their religious persuasion. They had moved from being a um, kind of New Age Hindu to a fundamentalist Muslim. And um, that seemed like a very... And they did that well in uh, California, upper class. I'm like, that seems like a very interesting step that doesn't make that much sense to me. And so I asked them questions about the theology of Islam, and if they really believed these aspects of the theology, and and it wasn't getting anywhere. Like, it, I, there was no place where they were really willing to look at the aspects of the theology that I was pretty sure they probably didn't believe. And But in the process of the way I was asking, I was actually damaging my rapport with this person. And in damaging rapport, I was damaging the ability to actually have a meaningful conversation about this or any topic, right? And so I stopped. 
And then I came back to let me see if I can just create rapport about anything. We get rapport. Fast forward about a year because it takes that much time to repair the rapport from an issue like this. And I end up finding out that this person comes to Islam and their particular beliefs. I'm not saying this would be true for everyone. I'm saying this one case, this was a place of realizing. Uh, this person's past was that they actually couldn't say no and they couldn't set limits or boundaries from themselves because of like family sexual trauma that had happened in their childhood. Mm -hmm. And they got to a place where they were there were some things that happened in their life and because they couldn't say no to some fairly terrible uh, things that led to their relationship breaking, whatever, and they, they're like, oh, wow, I'm going to die, basically, because I can't set limits or say no. And then right around that time, they met a friend who had just joined Islam, and they were talking about it and the rules and kind of the absoluteness of the rules <laughs> and that they didn't have to um, hold boundaries themselves they just being someone who believed that got to follow those rules and at a survival level that told this person oh she could actually survive because she could adopt a rule set that she now she could say no with that reason it it bypassed her childhood reasons of not being able to say no and so what I realized was it had nothing to do with theology, even though later the theology backfilled itself as a rationalization. And so I was addressing it at totally the wrong level, because it wasn't the level at which the decision was made. The choice wasn't made by a deep rational introspection and, and study of the theology compared to other theologies. And so then when I talked with them about basically just childhood and their ability to say no and set boundaries and construct those capacities inside of them rather than try to deconstruct a belief, once they actually felt they had that capacity, they ended up deconstructing the religious belief on their own. Right. Uh, their critical thinking couldn't kick in because it was, if their critical thinking kicked in or if they allowed anyone else's critical thinking to kick in, it would hit a survival level fear for them right. of mm -hmm. a belief that was meeting a need. And maybe it's the need to get to still be part of your family because if you leave the religion, you won't be part of the family or you won't be part of the community or, or you're too afraid of death and so you know there's an extent, whatever it is. Or it's, it's a situation where if you say this particular thing inside of academia and inside of the sciences, um, you'll be shunned for saying something that is so non-standard model that you lose all kinds of opportunities. So there's like all these little subtle and not so subtle sources of bias that affect the process of how we go about understanding reality. It's uh, it's also the same sort of mechanism um, I'm thinking of when you make a big change in your life or maybe you leave a place of employment and people become angry with you because you're changing, you're not what they expected anymore because for them there's they could receive it as an implicit, implicit criticism of themselves and their choices. And that's all happening kind of as a subtext and people are getting angry and they maybe don't know why they're angry. Yeah. Yeah, so now you come back to the cultural relativism and you see, okay, someone might have taken postmodern philosophy and used it as cognitive backfill to positions that largely came from other places. They didn't just come from a emotionally neutral, existentially neutral study of the topics and that this was the very best thinking they could come with on the topic. It might have been their own trauma or witnessing a trauma in the world that was so problematic that they took it on or resonated with it, and that's affecting then the way they are, you know, what they're resonating with intellectually and how they're processing it.